Mark David Chapman was born the 10th of May, 1955, Fort Worth, Texas. In 1971, he became a born-again Presbyterian, distributing biblical tracts, following an affair over which he felt great guilt in the breakup of his parents' marriage, he became more and more obsessive in his behaviours. On December the 8th in 1980, he left his room at the Sheraton Hotel and headed for the Dakota apartment block. He waited there all day, and that evening as John Lennon returned to his flat, he assassinated him. Mark David Chapman was born in 1960, brought up in Essex and Berkshire, and in 1980 he joined one William Arthurs at Trinity College Oxford to study politics and philosophy. Near the end of his first term at university, he stopped introducing himself as Mark David Chapman and began introducing himself as Mark David Chapman, but not that one. In 2011, Mark David Chapman introduced himself to me at Ripon College, Cudston, and I said, oh, like the man who killed John Lennon. And he responded, I had never noticed. Today, we just celebrate two people who are defined by who they are not. One, in the same way as Mr. Chapman, because he shares his name with a man of much greater infamy, the other because he is overshadowed by the fame of his namesake. The Simon we celebrate today is best known for not being Simon Peter. Instead, he is given the name Simon the Canaanian or Simon the Zealot. It suggests that perhaps he was a member of the Zealots, uh, Jewish freedom fighters or terrorists, probably not adverse to seeing off the odd Roman in a dark alley, or the moniker might simply be a description of his zeal for the Jewish law without any violence involved. Meanwhile, Jude is described as Judas, not Iscariot, to avoid any confusion of him with the disciple who betrayed Jesus. Luke names him as Judas, son of James. Matthew and Mark avoid any possibility of mistaking him for Judas Iscariot by naming him Thaddeus. Not only are they defined by who they are not, they all do very little, as far as we know, to create their own memorable characters. Between the two of them, they have a single speaking line in the whole of the four Gospels. If they were starring in a couple of months' time in our nativity play, they would be third shepherd and rear half of camel. Although the Bible is silent about Simon and Jude, we should remember that it does say a good deal about the disciples as a group, and that includes the two of them. So we can say that Jesus chose them to be his disciples after a night in prayer, and they responded readily, allowing their lives to be turned upside down. They lived with Jesus for three years, they saw the miracles, they heard his teachings, they had their moments of confusion, their moments of wonder. They fled when Jesus was arrested. They were present in the upper room when he was revealed, risen from the dead. They saw him ascend into heaven. They were filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. They faced persecution from the religious authorities. They became leaders in the early church in Jerusalem. Nevertheless, that the Gospels pay so little attention about the Twelve Apostles, and these two in particular, might strike us as decidedly odd. The details of their lives are lost to the past. In heaven, we will know them better, but now we know them through the legacy only of their faith, which is living in us. We cannot observe directly their actions, but we can observe their actions' effects. Namely, that we are here 
worshipping today. And here is a significant lesson for us. To be a disciple is not to be, uh, is not an exercise in in self-promotion. Holiness happens when we willingly disappear into the mission of the church. Our work, our mission is not about us, what we want, what we prefer, but about giving our lives over to Christ and letting as he wills. And you see around you today the effects of the mission of the Christians here at St Mary Abbots. Have you ever paused to wonder how it is that you come to a clean church each week? The floor swept, the cobwebs batted away, the candle stands clear. Do you know who cleans it? Their names you won't find on the back of the newsletter. You won't find them speaking at great length from the front of the church. But we thank them for they are an example of the holiness that happens when we willingly disappear into the mission of the church. Have you ever wondered how the coffee and the refreshments appear each week? Do you know who prepares them? Those people who arrive an hour before the service and leave long after it finishes so that this church can be a place of welcome and hospitality. They too, we thank, for they are an example of the holiness that happens when we willingly disappear into the mission of the church. Have you ever wondered why new people keep turning up each week? Do you know who invites them? Who has the courage to bid people come and join us in worship? There is no scoreboard that shows how many each of us has brought along. But they too, we thank. For they are an example of the holiness that happens when we willingly disappear into the mission of the church. Just as we benefit from the legacy of Simon and Jude, but know so little of their lives, So too do we benefit every week from the hidden labour and the ministry of many within this church. There are a few whose names and stories history will recall, but there are many more whose impact is just as significant, but who will go unnoticed. My weakness, and the reason I'm standing up here, is the need for affirmation to be seen standing at the front, but how much more blessed those whose strength of faith is such that they labour for the gospel, not to receive any worldly plaudits, but simply for the sake of our Lord. Today, we remember Simon and Jude, who proved themselves faithful by their willingness to live for Christ and to disappear in the mission of the church. And we give thanks for those who follow in their example, asking no reward or recognition, but ministering tirelessly for the love of the Lord. We thank you. Amen.